What's up, everybody? Welcome into another episode of Flippin' Bats. We have a great one for you today. We are live here at the Fox Studio lot in Los Angeles. We got a lot to catch you up on around the League of Baseball. There was another managerial firing, which I have an opinion on, and we will get to that soon. So some top storylines. We'll get to some lists as well. Top five, top five breakout players, both pitchers and position players, and of course, trivia. Trivia Thursday. We love it. I grade myself. Producer Conrad gives me these questions and some fan questions a little later. That's what I love about this Thursday show. It's live. It's interactive. High energy. We have a lot of fun, and we allow you guys to be a part of it, and you can ask questions, and I'll answer Whatever it may be, Producer Conrad, how are you doing, my friend? Are you going to take it easy on, on me with trivia today? I'm going to take it a little bit easier on you with trivia today. I mean, how, how can I not be good? The Mariners have won four series in a row, so I am at my peak happiness throughout the MLB season. And speaking of peak For those happiness, keeping track at home, it took producer Conrad roughly 10 seconds into the show. Wrong. Two the minutes. Mariners. He's two so minutes. back. Two minutes. <laughs> well, let's start with, uh, with you in Colorado the other day, playing in a charity tournament with the Colorado Rockies. Oh, yeah, man. That was... That was really cool. Now, the event was put on by UC Health. It was at Coors Field in Denver, so the Rockies were gracious hosts. But it was uh, an event to raise money for cancer patients, uh, to raise money for the American Cancer Association or Society. And it was really, really cool. I was asked to go be a part of it. Uh, It was called Healthy Swings Event, and I went and got to take BP on the field at Coors Field and ended up raising the most money of, of everybody there. And what was really cool about this is um, we raised over a quarter million dollars for cancer. And it, it's really special, and it was really cool to be a part of. There were 14 Denver Broncos players there, Melvin Gordon, uh, Cortland Sutton, Ronald Darby, um, Tim Patrick, there were a bunch of big names there as well. And some of them had some good slings. Some of them were the worst baseball players I've ever seen. But it was a lot of fun, and a quarter million dollars was raised. And I took home a trophy, hit like five or six home runs at Coors Field, uh, got to participate like at the end. I did a little fun like hit off with Vinny Castilla and Cortland Sutton. And it was just an absolute blast. So, um, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. It was really cool, a lot of fun to be a part of. And at the end of the day, it was about raising a lot of money. And I think they said the most – this is like the fourth or fifth year they've done it. The most money that was raised before was $115,000. We raised $255,000 that day. So a really cool event, event to be a part of. Yeah, absolutely. I mean – Obviously, anything for charity like that is such a really cool thing to be a part of. And for me personally, I'm, I'm so happy to see that Coors Field Effect is still very alive and well with you hit their wow. bombs. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, let's, Thanks, uh, man. Let, let's move over to these Angels. You know, they've lost 14 games in a row and Joe Madden got fired on Monday. So let's let's break down what's going on in Anaheim. Yeah. So the second manager of the year is out. Uh, the first time since 2018 that a manager has been fired before the All-Star break, and it's now happened twice this year. Joe Girardi from the Phillies and now Joe Madden from the Angels. And this one's surprising. Uh, you know, the Angels were playing really well, and, and then they weren't. And the Angels are now in the midst of the longest losing streak in the history of their team, of their organization. It's at 14 games now. When Joe Madden was fired, it was at 12. So let me talk about the firing in particular. Because it it was surprising. Surprising for many. And he's a big name. He's won a World Series. He's Joe Madden. He's an unconventional guy that had been getting the job done. Well, guess what? Baseball is very much so a what-have-you-done-for-me-lately sport. Well, let's talk about what he's done lately. He's been in L.A. with the Angels for three years now. Every single one of those years, he has been under 500. So far this year, under 500. He has a record of 130 and 148 with the Angels and his time there. That's not getting the job done. And unfortunately, or fortunately, however you look at it, that's the nature of the business. This is how it's done. When a team goes on a skid, the first person you look at 
when you need to make a change, is the manager or the head coach, whatever the sport may be. The guy leading the way is oftentimes the skate the scapegoat for something. Is is Joe Madden the scapegoat here? I, I don't know. There's certainly been some things throughout the year that have made you scratch your head. Um, so Joe Madden is out. This tweet, interim Angels manager Phil Nevin. This isn't how I envisioned getting an MLB job. I thought this would be a happy day, but these are different circumstances. But the conversation I had with Joe Madden put me at ease. He told me to take this opportunity and run with it. So, yeah, he's out. And there's a lot of people up in arms about this. Joe Madden isn't to blame. It's the team. Well, Joe Madden has now been the manager of a team with two of the biggest superstars and two of the best players, two MVPs, for three years now. Yes, there's been injuries involved, but you have to win ball games, especially for a manager like him that is considered unconventional. When it works out, you're, you're an evil genius. When it doesn't work out, it looks awful. And it comes back on you. And then your name starts getting floated around. Is this guy needs to, he needs to be fired? What is he doing? Those those things start to swirl when he does those things that he's been doing a lot in his career. But when it pays off, great. When it's not, well, guess what? He's now out of a job. Joe Madden intentionally walked Corey Seager earlier this year down a run. They were losing three to two with the bases loaded. He intentionally walked Corey Seager to make it a four to two ball game. Corey Seager is a good Major League Baseball player. He's not Barry Bonds. They, they, they go down another run. They end up winning that game. He gets bailed out by his team. But it was a bonehead move. Just things like that make you scratch your head. I know afterwards he said, yeah, I just thought it might get my team to, to shake him up a little bit. It shook him up. Mike Trout was in the outfield counting the base runners. Like, what, what did we just do? And I know they ended up winning some games, but then they go on this long stretch. Their closer, who's a good good pitcher, Rysel Iglesias, hadn't pitched in nine days. And then Joe Madden brings him in in the eighth inning to get five outs for a save, something he's not comfortable with, he doesn't do often. If you haven't had a guy pitch in a while, you want to put him back in in a situation that he's familiar with, perhaps a save situation in the ninth inning. So there's just been some things along the way, but the truth of the matter is whether it was warranted or not, or you want to place a bunch of the blame on Joe Madden or not, he hasn't been getting the job done. Plain and simple. You now have a team that is very talented and, again, has two of the best players on the planet, and everybody knows time is, time is ticking with this team. Shohei Otani has said before, I just want to win. That's what I want to do. I want to win baseball games. So then they go in and they bring in some new pitchers. They put a team together that's apparently really good and going to compete for a playoff spot. They're in a good position. And then they go on a 12-game losing streak. That's unacceptable. It's unacceptable to lose 12 in a row, which is when he got fired. So I'm not going to put the last two on him. But a team that talented cannot be losing 12 games in a row. And he doesn't exactly have the track record with the Angels of earning more time. He hasn't won there. He's 130 and 148 with the Angels. That's his, that's his record when all is said and done. This is the nature of the business. When a team struggles, when a team goes on a really tough skid, when you're expected to win ball games, it falls back on a manager. That's just the truth of the matter. That's the nature of the beast. And it fell back on Joe Madden, who is now out of a job after two years and some change with the Angels, in which he didn't once have a winning season with the Angels. Now, there were injuries involved. Uh, Anthony Rendon missed 127 total games in his time, in, in Joe Madden's time with the Angels. Mike Trout missed 138 total games. Shohei Otani didn't pitch much in 2020, so there were injuries involved. I will admit that, but you got to win. What have you done for me lately? Well, he lost 12 games in a row, and his time with the Angels came to an end. Producer Conrad, surprising, I will say surprising, 
Um, but I, I wasn't like. I wasn't thrown off by this. I totally understand it. You got to win now. He wasn't winning. This can kind of send, and he said it best early in the year. He said, this can kind of send a message to my guys, a little shock. Well, this will send another shock to a team that needs to be better than they were when he finished up there in Anaheim. Yeah. You know, I mean, I I think when you go on such a long losing streak like that, you just can't have that much of a payroll. You can't have that much talent. The same thing with the Phillies. We talked off air about it too, where again, I know I bring everything back to Seattle. A lot of people called for Scott services job, but he had half the payroll of the Phillies. They're not spending that much money. So it makes it a lot harder. I think to make a very hard decision this early in the season and not let guys just play it out. Uh, But let's move on. Well, one, one more second here. Let's look at, his track record because Joe Madden has been considered a really good manager and he's a world series winner. And I'm not here to say he's a bad manager, but like I said a little while ago, some of those moves you start making, if they're not working out, well, it looks really bad and it falls back on you, but he took over a Tampa team. He took over with the Rays. I I believe the devil Rays when he took over there, he was there for nine seasons, six of those seasons. They were above 500 and made four playoff appearances. In Chicago, when he went to the Cubs, he was there for five seasons. They made the playoffs in four of those seasons, and they won a World Series in 2016. Now he's had two full seasons with the Angels, zero seasons above 500, and now they're the only team ever to be 10 games or more above 500 and to go on a 14-game losing streak. 12 at the time was still the only team ever. So this is different. And maybe Joe Madden has been a great manager in the past, and I'm not saying he's not a good manager, but it's what have you done for me lately, and it hasn't been good in in Anaheim, and they got to figure it out. It's win now for this team. You have Mike Trout and Shohei Otani. It's win right now. And they had to do something, and they did something drastic. Yeah. Sometimes you just have to make that move. I know it's never easy to happen that early in the year, but when you go on long 10-game losing streaks and you were 13 games over and now you're looking down the barrel of a losing record, you just have to make the moves. Let's move on to another team that is actually playing really good baseball, the top in the AL, this New York Yankees team, and they're climbed to the top this season. The New York Yankees are 40 and 15. 40 and 15. How did we get here? This team's not vastly different than what we saw last year. So how are we here? How are the Yankees 40 and 15 with the best winning percentage in all of baseball at 727, the only team over a 700 winning percentage? The Mets are the second closest at 655. That's incredible. The Yankees are on pace to win 118 games. 118 and 44 is the pace they are on, which would break the all time record set by the Cubs and your Mariners, producer Conrad, at 116 wins. They're on pace to break that. So, how? Why? What are they doing different? Well, the moves they made this offseason clearly have worked, okay? It's just made for a different team. They're more dynamic. They bring a guy in that has a, an energy and a passion and a fire to them that the Yankees could use. They play good defense. They have speed guys they can bring off the bench. It's a different team. It's dynamic. They appear to be healthy so far this year. But the team that they had last year was still very good. They might have even underperformed. Now let's really talk about why this team is so good. It's the pitching. The New York Yankees pitching rotation has been the best in baseball, and it has been historically good. Not even close to anybody else in the league. That's how good they have been. They've allowed the least amount of runs. They have the lowest, listen to this, they have the lowest ERA in baseball, the lowest whip, the lowest opponent batting average, the lowest on base percentage, the lowest OPS, and their relievers have the third best ERA in all of baseball. That's incredible. They have one starter of all five with an ERA above three. All other four starters are under a three ERA. Every single one of their starting pitchers is in the top 25 in Major League Baseball in ERA. Every single one. Gary Cole, who is the leader of this rotation, who hasn't even been the best one in the rotation in his last eight starts, 
has eight walks and 69 strikeouts with a 2.03 ERA and a 1.73 FIP. That's incredible. This rotation has been lights out. And what I want to do now is bring on a guy that talks Yankees, for, talks about the AL East, and we're going to get to dive into him. And this is what I want to ask him. I want to ask him about the starting rotation. I want to ask him why they are doing this. I want to ask him about how much money Aaron Judge is about to get paid when he gets his new contract. But his job, and he works for Fox Sports and writes for us, we're going to bring in Jake Mintz in just a second. We're going to bring him in right now is what we're going to do, and we're going to talk a little bit about the New York Yankees. Jake, thank you so much for joining me, my friend. It is a pleasure and a privilege to be joining you on this beautiful Thursday afternoon here in New York City, Ben. A beautiful day there. I love to hear that. Um, yeah, so thanks again. And where I want to start with is this pitching rotation. And, and the first question I want to ask you is, what is different – between this year and last year even? So I think the biggest thing so far has been health. And what I mean specifically by that is that no Yankee starter has missed a turn. So if you look at their numbers, every single guy has made every single start. Cole has 11 starts, Cortez has 11, Tyon 11, Montgomery 11, Severino 10, right? And so the reason that pitching staff struggle is because the random schlub at AAA, whose name we don't know has to hop in and make bad starts, right? The Yankees pitchers have been outstanding. Yes. And they'll probably continue to be this good moving forward. But what's really key is that they've been healthy and that they've been on the field every five days. Yeah. Health is big for them. And, and it's nice to see all, I mean, Severino pitching as he has this year has been incredible. Talk a little bit about, their pitching coach and what he has clearly brought to this team and everything I've heard from guys and you're right there in the thick of it and have been able to talk to guys. But from everything I've heard, he has brought a sense of regiment to these guys, a sense of just having a routine and a structure that has really helped them. And they seem to speak volumes about him and what he has brought to this staff as a whole. Yeah, I think Something you notice when you're around the Yankees this year is the kind of camaraderie of the pitching staff. There are a lot of conversations happening all the time um, on and off the field. They always go out together at the exact same time as a big group. Um, and I think talking to players, the thing that they really value from the kind of the pitching coach group right now is the level of communication and what, are expected of certain players as an example, Michael King, who had been pitching in kind of short bursts last season out of the bullpen, the Yankees came to him and were like, we want you to kind of extend yourself a little bit and pull, pitch multiple innings at a time. So now he's been able to do that. The Yankees kind of changed his off season programming and his throwing in spring training. And so for the first chunk of the year, you could see he was basically throwing three innings every four days out of the bullpen. And that's really unique. And that's a huge yeah. kind of kudos to the coaching staff for communicating that to him properly. What has been the biggest difference this year for Clay Holmes? Have you been able to talk to him and just pick his brain at all about, about pitching? I mean, he's thrown 26 and two thirds innings this year. He's eight and eight in save opportunities, a 0 0.34 ERA and 28 Ks to only three walks. What has been the biggest difference for him this year? I mean, he's, he's the best reliever in baseball. Like, ever yeah. since he got to the Yankees, he's taken this huge step forward. My partner, Jordan Schusterman, wrote a big thing about Holmes. He talked to him uh, a couple months ago. But the thing with Holmes is, like, if you remember, the Yankees acquired him halfway through last season, like, during the trade deadline, and Yankees fans were up in arms. How did we not get more guys? Like, is this really the guy that we got? You can go back and look at the quote tweets from the Yankees announcing that trade. And people were like, <laughs> who, why'd we get this guy? Right. People were like, we need more, but clearly Brian Cashman right. knows what he's doing. This is a smart guy. You don't get to be the general manager of the Yankees and convince the Steinbrenners to give you the keys for, you know, two decades. If you're a dumb dumb. So Clay Holmes is a really good example of that. It's really simple for him. I mean, the, right. The sinker, it's just the best pitch in baseball. Garrett Cole told me that, right. 
He said, Clay Holmes, a sinker is the best pitch in baseball. He throws it at a crazy high percentage. Everybody just beats it into the ground. And the guy you would kind of compare him to would be a right-handed peak Zach Britton. Wow. I mean, it, it's, it's a, it's a hundred and it moves like a, like a right-handed change up. And that's not an yeah. exaggeration. It legitimately moves like a circle change up at a hundred miles an hour. Let's shift gears a little bit to the offense and in particular, Aaron judge. I know you recently spoke to him and wrote a really awesome article, by the way, I haven't been able to text you and reach out to you, but I read it. It was awesome. It was really cool to read that. Um, let's talk a little bit about that. His approach this year. Um, is it different than last year or is he just uber focused wants a new contract and is just killing it this year and, and really focusing on what he needs to focus on? I, th I think he's just locked in, right? Yeah. He's hot. He's on fire. He's seeing the ball really well. And I think he has a very clear understanding of what he needs to do to succeed. Right. I think sometimes superstars um, like judge can get lost in, the details sometimes. And I, I feel yeah. like having talked to him, he has really simplified his approach and simplified the things that he thinks about when he's at the plate. Um, we talked a lot about his back hip as kind of a big cue for him to rotate through the baseball. Um, but yet like he, he's playing for millions, right? He took a huge yeah. gamble on himself the day before the season turning down. I think it was over $200 million, seven years yeah. seconds before the first pitch of opening day. And at the time, people thought it was the wrong decision, right? And he has proven it so far to be the right move. He should make more money now than he was going to before if he keeps up this pace and wins the AL MVP. All right, I'm going to put you on the spot here. How much are we talking, Jake? What, what is a potential? Let's say, let's say he goes on, and, and these numbers are, are ridiculous, but Aaron Judge is on pace to hit 66 home runs, have 193 hits, 136 RBIs, and is on pace for a 10.2 war. Let's so, just say the numbers end up close to that. What does a contract look for him? I... Okay, if the numbers end up close to that, which I'm a little skeptical they will... You yeah. have to just take a look at, at other superstars and the money that they've gotten. I don't think he gets to Mookie, to what Mookie got, and that's just because of how old Aaron Judge is, right? In our minds, he's relatively new because he came up at a pretty late age for a rookie. I believe he was 26, his, 25 was his rookie of the year season. And what that means is hitting free agency at 30, people aren't going to want him when he's 36, 37. And so – that and his defense potentially not aging well. And again, we're just nitpicking a fantastic player here. I want to be clear. So I would say, I mean, if he turned down like seven to 40, I think. So I don't see a, a team giving him eight years, but I think he could just up the yeah. annual average value and get to like seven to 70 or around there. I agree. Is he, and you might not know the answer the answer, I obviously you don't, but how likely is it? I mean, what would you put a percentage at of Aaron Judge not being a New York Yankee next year? Are we talking like 5%? Are we talking like 50%? You can just completely ballpark it. What are we looking at yet there? He's coming back. Yeah, like, yeah, that's, I would that's be right. shocked if he leaves. The, the organization and the player benefit from one another. He is comfortable there and they will pay him, right? This is not a yeah. situation when the Red Sox traded Mookie Betts to save a couple bucks. Aaron Judge, if it all goes right, should stay in pinstripes. The contract that the Yankees offered him was well above what people thought he deserved at that point. And he still turned it down, which is as is right. And like he's shown that that was the right decision. But the Yankees made a, a pretty generous offer. And I think that showed their intent to make sure he stays around. It's judges judge made the right call and like going to free agency. He'll be able to bump that number up. But at the end of the yeah. day, I would say it's a I would say a 90 to 95% chance that he stays. Okay. Now, again, knock on wood, like he could, he could get hurt or the, you know, the production could tail off a million things could happen. We've seen wilder things happen, but,
but I feel pretty confident he'll be in New York for a long time. Last one for you before I let you go. The Yankees are going to be one of the best teams in baseball come time for around the trade deadline. What are, what are some things that you think they need to improve on? Can this rotation, I don't want to say keep this up all year because I don't think that's feasible, but are they going to look to add in this rotation that's historically good right now? Are they going to look to add a bat? What can we look for with the New York Yankees around the trade deadline? So there are three things in my mind. One is starting pitching depth, right? They don't need a frontline guy to go every fifth day. They need someone who is like a four starter right now who can hop in and be their sixth starter if a guy goes down. Um, Yankees fans won't love this name, but like Jay Happ is that type of guy. Don't um, They shouldn't go get Jay Happ because that didn't go well the first time. <laughs> but like, you know, someone who is a veteran who has experience pitching and pressure situations who can suck up a bunch of innings, right? And they've yeah. gone out and gotten that guy before. They got went out and got Lance Lynn before Lance Lynn turned into Lance Lynn um, a, a number of years ago. They went out and got Jay Happ for that same thing. So I think they'll find a veteran with some experience to kind of give them ro- some rotation depth. So that's the first thing. Second thing is is more bullpen arms. So Chapman is still in the IL and he was ineffective before he went on the IL. Jonathan Loisaga ineffective and on the IL as well. That kind of leaves their bullpen pretty shallow. Right now you've got yeah. Clay Holmes. Miguel Castro, Michael King, Lucas Lutke, Wandy Peralta, and then Clark Schmidt's been very, very good. None of those guys are like, you know, shut down, hand them the ball, feel outstanding about this, except for right. um, Holmes. And so right. I would imagine they go out and get some sort of veteran arm or another Clay Holmes type guy with really good numbers on a bad team, similar to what Cashman did last year. You know, if like Mark Melanson has a good month, I know he has another year on his deal, um, but he's like a type of veteran arm they could go and get to kind of stabilize the bullpen. Um, and then uh, David Bednar with the Pirates is just go get the yeah. Pirates closer this year, right? He's a good bullpen arm. And then the last one is center yeah. field. And this is just an uncomfortable conversation about Aaron Hicks, who has been a little bit better recently, but has really struggled this year coming right. back from injury and, is in my opinion, the weakest link in the offense. I think Joey Gallo will eventually figure it out. He is the player he is. He's not going to change. He has gotten some booze in the Bronx, which I don't necessarily think is like an indication that he needs to alter anything. That being said, I think Hicks is the guy where it's like, if you really want to upgrade and you want to get like an elite center field defender to put out there and similar to how they went out and got a good, not elite, but a good defender at shortstop in, in IKF, Isaiah kiner Falefa, that's a place that they can improve. Um, I would assume that maybe Brian Cashman thinks that Tim LaCastro might be that guy. He's been hurt so far this year. But I would say center field, starting pitching in the bullpen are the three places you could really see them make a move. All right, perfect. We'll be on the lookout for that. Jake, thank you so much for joining me, my friend. Always, always appreciate it. Keep it easy, Ben. <laughs> See you, man. All right, producer Conrad, where to next, my friend? Yeah, man, after that great conversation about the Yankees, let's move on over to your brother. Your brother had a pretty good night the other night against my Mariners and now officially 17th all-time in strikeouts. Yes, he is now 17th all-time on the Major League Baseball strikeout list. How cool is that? My brother is 17th all-time on the Major League Baseball strikeout list. Passing John Smoltz, he is now the active leader in all of Major League Baseball in strikeouts at 3,086. And he's not done. Obviously, he's not done pitching, but he's not done this year passing guys. There are multiple guys in his reach. So he's at 3,086 strikeouts. He's just... Very close behind CC Sabathia at 3,093. He could get that in his next start. So CC is 16th at 3,093. Kurt Schilling, 3,116 at 15. Bob Gibson is 14th on the list. Pedro Martinez is 13th on the list. And Fergie Jenkins is 12th on this list at 3,192. So Justin is just over. 
100 strikeouts away from being 12th on the all-time strikeout list. That could theoretically happen this season. Now, the other night, he punched out 12 guys, gave up one run, and entered where he is now, 17th on the list. He passed John Smoltz. Now, the cool thing about this for me is that the day Justin did that, the night he passed John Smoltz, is the day that I had John Smoltz on this podcast. I had John Smoltz on on Tuesday, and that night Justin passed him, which is a really cool moment for me because I grew up the big, the biggest Atlanta Braves fan that you can find. I mean, I was a massive fan. I grew up 15 minutes from the AAA stadium, the Richmond Braves. They were on TBS every night, so I, I watched them every day, every night. And that was right in the height of that run of 14 consecutive division titles for the Braves. And it was all Maddox, Smoltz, Glavin, those guys. I was a huge John Smoltz fan. I had him on this show. And had you told 12-year-old Ben that that would happen, that I would have my own show for Fox Sports, and one day I would have John Smoltz on, I would have cried. That's just the truth. I probably would have just broken down and cried. But that is what happened. And on Tuesday, I had on John Smoltz. And that very same night, my brother passed him on the all-time strikeout list. How cool is that? 17th all-time now, the active Major League Baseball leader, and just over 100 strikeouts away from being 12th all-time. Are you kidding me? Absolutely incredible. I could not be more proud of him. I could not be more proud of how he's gotten here, how persistent he has stayed, how long he's done this. He's been doing this my whole life, basically. He's been in the big leagues since I was 12 years old. And he's still doing it. Almost 20 years later. What? I was 12. I'm now 30. By my math, that's 18 years. Pretty impressive. And at the end of this year, he could be 12th all time. But that's a could be. Right now, as we speak, he has passed John Smoltz, and he is 17th all time in Major League Baseball strikeouts. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. I mean, luckily, I got to see it happen live as he struck out 12 Mariners. In easy fashion. <laughs> let's let's just say that. Your night was a lot more exciting than mine, watching him mow down my guys. But let's stick with those Braves. Talking about he passed John Smoltz. Let's talk about how hot these Braves are since Ronald Acuna has been back and kind of their new trajectory going into the second half of the year. I sat here a couple of weeks ago, and I called out the Atlanta Braves, and I called them out hard. Why? Well, one, because they stunk. Two, because they're too good to stink. And three, because I have them in the World Series, and I need them to be better than they have been. And since that moment, they have been light years better. They're in the midst of a seven-game winning streak before this seven-game winning streak. So their first 50 games of the season, they've been outscored by their opponents 223 to 207. That's a negative 16 run differential scoring 4.1 runs per game. In this stretch, since they have turned it around, since I called them out, they are outscoring their opponents 52 to 20, plus 32 run differential, scoring 7.4 runs per game. I had this Braves team back in the World Series because I believe that they were a better team than they were last year when, oh, guess what? They won the World Series. Yes, they lose Freddie Freeman. Your team never gets better when you lose a Freddie Freeman. But they did a really good job of locking up that position. They get Matt Olson, who right now might not be as good as Freddie Freeman, but they locked him up for a long time to come. He is younger. He plays great defense. He rakes. He is just a slight tick back. Let's look elsewhere. Ronald Acuna was going to come back this year. He's come back in full force. He even got an all-star vote from me. And you can, you can vote for All-Stars now. He got my vote. That's how good he's been. And in just a little while, we're going to do a segment on my All-Star votes and producer Conrad's as well. He is back 
He is killing it. He's been a big reason for their resurgence. Mike Soroka is expected back at some point this year. That really young rotation, Max Fried, Kyle Wright, they're only going to be better than they were last year, having that World Series experience. But this offense is the reason I picked them to be back, and they just weren't very good until this stretch that they have been on. Now, <laughs> they're killing it. 7.4 runs per game. Ronald Acuna on this stretch is hitting 500 with three homers, five RBIs, a stolen base, eight runs scored. Ronald Acuna is immediately and fastly becoming perhaps the face of baseball. I, as we sit here and speak right now, believe that Shohei Otani is the face of baseball. He's not the exciting guy that you view. Like, he's not the guy flipping his bat and doing stuff like that. Those guys are helping grow the game of baseball. Ronald Acuna is growing the game of baseball. Shohei Otani is, is changing the game of baseball for the better. I believe Ronald Acuna is quickly getting to that discussion of face of baseball. Look at the things he's doing right now. He's hitting homers. He's doing the LeBron James celebration. He's doing he's doing all of these celebrations around basketball. Trey Young, I mean, he is looking at the pop culture that's happening in our country right now and looking around sports and seeing all of the cool celebrations and seeing LeBron James and he's doing those celebrations and LeBron James is tweeting about it. Ronald Acuna is talking about it. What he's bringing to the game of baseball has been incredible. And in this stretch, since he's come back, he's been incredible. Trey Young, he did the Trey Young celebration the other night. He tweeted about it. Told y'all it wouldn't be long. Ronald Acuna Jr., too cold. How cool is this? These guys are changing the game of basketball Ronald Acuna is changing the game of baseball, and now they're all doing it and talking about it together. You know I love that. This show is all about growing the game of baseball, shining a positive light on the game of baseball. You know I had to talk about this. It's incredible. But the Braves are turning it around themselves. Since that day, since they turned it around, they have had Michael Harris get called up. And on this seven-game winning streak, he's hitting 321 with five extra base hits, four RBIs. He's their top prospect. He's come up and made a difference. So now as we sit here today, as we sit here right now, the Atlanta Braves are second in baseball in home runs, first in slugging percentage, first in total bases, and third in pitching strikeouts. The Atlanta Braves are back. That's why I predicted them in the World Series, because I knew they could be this good. And just over a week ago, I called them out on this show. And now, here I sit, and I am declaring the Atlanta Braves back. That's how good they have been. They've been hitting, and they have been pitching well. Their bullpen has been lights out. Their bullpen has been dominant. The Atlanta Braves are back, and I feel good about my prediction. I'm not saying they're going to win this division, because the New York Mets are really really good. But the Braves can the Braves can get in the playoffs. There's three playoff there's three wild card teams. The Atlanta Braves can get in. They have that experience now. They can do some damage and I feel good as we sit right now about my prediction. Yeah. I, I think th it's time right now, producer Conrad. Is it are we getting to trivia? Is oh, it yeah. that time? Oh yeah, we're going to trivia right now. I hope you're ready. Oh, I hope you're baby. ready. Last two For weeks. those keeping track yeah, the last two weeks we've been starting trivia, and um, they they went okay. I got a B plus, I believe, the first time, an A minus last week. Now I think we've done this for three weeks now. It's always a blast of a segment, though. I promise you that. And no matter what happens, I could get them all wrong. We're gonna have fun. So let's get to it. All right, John Marcus, put twenty on the clock. First up, there's been two cycles this season. What is the most amount of cycles in a season in MLB history? I have I have three for you. A, 6, B, 8, C, 10. All right. 6, 8, or 10. I don't think you would have gone the middle option of 8. I, I'm going to go 6. I'm going to say 6. You don't know me very well. I went the middle option. It's 8. You did go the middle option? Oh, my God. You're Okay. okay. Little, little, right. little bonus. Little bonus one to this one. Has there ever been a completed home run cycle in MLB history? I believe so, yes. 
No, there hasn't. That's a du- Can we get there a double a double wait, negative? Wait, what do you mean a complete like a single double triple and a home run all in order? No, I'm talking about like there's been a home run with one guy on base, no guys on base, two guys on base, and bases loaded. A complete oh, a solo, cycle. a two run three. Oh no, no, that's a correct answer. The answer there is no. That has never happened. Okay, yeah, you got that one then. <laughs> also, uh, this. Tell me what's going on. Are our sound, uh, do we have sound effects for this one? Or are they not working today? Because normally the sound effects add to my nerves, but also the excitement. And I noticed I didn't get hit with the hard <clears throat> when I got that wrong. <laughs> All right, we got to start hitting with the hard earns. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next up, which active player is next closest to three thousand career hits in Major League Baseball? What active player is next close? <laughs> oh boy, here's the sound effects. Um, next closest to 3,000. Oh my God, I know this one. I know this one. Why can't I get it? Is it, I know he's up there. I feel like this is wrong. Is it Manny Machado? Ooh. Well, you almost had it, it was close. Robinson Cano, 2,635. Yeah, he ain't getting there. <laughs> he can't even get one hit anymore. Um, I know Machado's up there and has he's in the discussion for getting to 3,000. I don't think anybody – we're not going to see 3,000 for a long, long time. I know that. Miggy just recently reached it. But uh, I didn't get that one. Wait, Robinson Cano isn't – he's not on a team right now. He was just on the Padres last week. He's going to still be playing baseball somewhere this year. But he is active still. He hasn't retired yet. Yeah, I guess. But okay. All right. All right. I'm wrong, but I got the bonus one right, so I'm sitting at an A minus right now. All right, here we go. Next one. This one's true or false. All right. So this one's a little fifty fifty shot for you. Mike Trout has the same amount of AL MVPs as he does a hundred RBI seasons. Oh my God. AL MVPs as he does a hundred RBI seasons. I am going to say false. I'm going to say you're wrong. Jesus Christ. I thought he would have had more 100 RBI seasons than he had his three MVPs. I knew he had three MVPs. I would have thought he was in the four to five range of the 100 RBIs. But okay, I'm not doing great. I'm going to bump myself down to a C. Oh, we're at a low point here. All right. Yeah. Next up, which player leads Major League Baseball in extra base hits? <laughs> this timer gets me every time. Who leads baseball in extra base hits? Um, Aaron Judge? Raphael Devers. No way. This is so bad today. This is by far the worst. I mean, I went with the leader in home runs by a good bit. I mean, how could, I mean, I can't be that far off and. I think I think I'm Aaron Judge has like thirty or thirty one. Rafael Devers thirty six extra base hits. People haven't been talking about him enough. Guy's been raking. All right, next up, Dodgers have two pitchers tied for MLB lead in wins. Who are they? Tyler Alexander. Tyler Anderson. I'll give that one to you. Tyler, and- yeah, yeah. Tyler Anderson and uh, Tony Gonsolin. There we go. Very nice. We're on the board. I knew, I knew that. Yeah, I, I knew. I knew that one. I knew the name. I, I'm good friends with the guy in the Tigers organization who's also a pitcher, Tyler Alexander. But I knew they weren't the same person. We knew who I was thinking about. So thank you for giving me the correct answer. Yeah, I got you, Tyler Anderson. All right, next next one up before we have a special bonus question for the entire group here. Which team has scored the most runs in Major League Baseball this season? This one surprised me. I will have to say. It surprised you? It did surprise me. Uh, 11 seconds. Okay. You looking at the Google? The Yankees are fourth in runs scored. No, I was looking back in the... So I'm going to say... Oh, no. I'm just going to say the Braves. Oh, the Mets. Close. Same division, right? Is that, That's kind of well, surprising, Braves, though, right? The it is, but the reason I said the Braves, and I know they haven't been very good except they're getting better, but where they are, in ba- they're second in home runs, first in slugging percentage, so I threw a shot in the dark. Um, not great. Not great. I know there's a bonus question. At least I got one of these right so far. But of all the trivias so far, I've been doing pretty well. This one's a struggle, so let's hope I get the bonus question. So you know what? said it's for the group. I'm not 
I'm not that's what I'm saying. You know, John Marcus, the rest of the group can help you out. So all of these bonus questions I'll be asking, we have the all-star game coming up in Los Angeles in a month from now. So they're all going to kind of be Dodgers related, all-star related. Who was the last Dodgers player to be named all-star game MVP? <sighs> Director John, do you know this one? I guess I, I guess I'm on my own here. I, I wish you could hear them all arguing in the room next to me. Okay. Uh, I'm going to say Clayton Kershaw. Mike Piazza. 1996. 1996. Good year. Okay. Good year. Great year. <laughs> um, okay. So now it's time. Are we done with the... Yeah, yeah, we're is done. Is that the last question? Yes. All right. It's time, as with every show, that I grade myself. And this has been the toughest one. I got one right. These were hard questions. Um, so naturally, there's a bell curve involved because the class didn't get many correct as a whole. So I'm going to say I probably would have given myself like a, a D plus in overall. But because of the bell curve of the average grade of the class being a D plus, you want to bump it up to a C. I'm going to give myself a C plus for today's trivia and uh, I, there's nothing I can say, but I need to be better. And you need to ask easier questions. So we'll I mean, e- even beforehand, our social producer trip came in. He said, I think this is the easiest week yet. And uh, here we oh, are. He wouldn't have gotten <laughs> He's a Dodgers fan, and he couldn't even get the last question right. What does he mean? Come on. I love it. All right. Well, let's move on to another little competition we got going on. Pick to click. Pick to click. Yes. As we discussed last week, um, we were, we were going to be going head to head. You chose Julio Rodriguez, I believe. Tell me if this is right. You, you chose him to hit a home run and steal a base. Um, he is up. He's leading baseball in stolen bases, so that was a moot point. You knew that was going to happen. So you chose one player to hit a home run. I chose two in Mike Trout and Shohei Otani. Now, what I will say, because it hasn't happened, Mike Trout hit his homer. So basically, we t- we. T- we're on a level playing field with our pick to click, but you chose an easier one. Now, Shohei pitches tonight, pitches and hits tonight. So what I will say, and I will allow you to be a part of this, Producer Conrad, will we count this, and can we count this, if Shohei hits a home run in his game tonight, on Thursday night, will we count it as a victory for or a tie if Shohei homers? I'll, I'll, I'll give you the tie. I, I can tell you're rattled from going down 0-1. So, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll consider it a tie. If Shohei can go deep tonight, and you know what? If Shohei can go deep tonight and the Angels can win a game, I'll give you this week. I'll, 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 you're I'll, not giving me anything. I picked the harder pick to click. So don't like, that's what, you, you, this isn't like a pity ask. It's like, I picked a harder one. I could have just gone Mike Trout to hit a home run. And like you did, and I would, we would have tied. But I went Mike Trout and Shohei Otani. Little did I know that they would hit one home run over the course of the last week, and it'd be Mike Trout. And the Angels would go on a 14-game losing streak, and this has just been a fiasco. But I mean, listen, you know, you know. I knew Julio Rodriguez was going to hit a home run and steal a base so it is what it is let's uh let's go do this yeah. this week's pick to click I for yourself water's though wet it's like come on okay pick to click i almost went this week with i almost went with the los angeles angels would win a baseball game but i decided it's week two against conrad and it's too early to do that so what i am going to go with here is that vladdy jr who has been struggling this year it has been a struggle has been hitting under 200 the last couple of weeks of the year. I'm going to predict that he turns it around a little bit. So what I'm going to say is that Vladdy Jr. hits a home run between now and next week's show. Okay. I like that. I mean, Vladdy Vladdy hasn't been that hot this season. Uh, You're going to really like mine. I I really dug deep for this one. I'm going to go with with Justin Verlander gets eight-plus strikeouts next game to pass CC Sabathia to be 16th all time. Well, I'm not going to root against you. There we Dang go. You see now. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, I, now I'm in a weird little prediction. Welcome to but the I Thunderdome. Like so eight plus, or is it, does he need nine to pass or does eight. he need he eight? Needs eight. So I think he's going to get eight or more after watching him okay. fan out 12 Mariners the other night. There's no doubt in my mind. This guy's going to get eight strikeouts in the next start. All right. I like it. So mine is Vladdy Jr. hits a home run, starts to turn it around a little bit. 
which I, I th- all fans of baseball need to hope for. This guy was almost winning a triple crown last year. He was exciting. This year hasn't been as good. I hope he hits a home run this week. Producer Conrad, Justin gets eight or more strikeouts in his start this week and passes CC Sabathia on the all-time strikeout list. I like that a lot. Producer Conrad, where to next, my friend? You know what? Let's have some fun. MLB All-Star uh, voting just started the other day, so let's kind of look at your ballot for the MLB All-Star game. And let's see kind of like where we had differences and let's just show your team. Let's reveal it. There it is. Yeah. So I want to, I'll go through mine. Uh, All-Star game voting started yesterday. So I came out with my ballot and uh, so we'll, we'll, I'll run through mine and Conrad, we can discuss after what you would have changed and, and ask why I put somebody anywhere that they are. So first base, we'll, we'll start with the American league. I went Ty France at first base. Jose Altuve at second base. Jose Ramirez at third. Xander Bogarts at short. Aaron Judge, Mike Trout, Taylor Ward in the outfield. Alejandro Kirk at catcher. And Shohei Otani at DH. Now, do you want to run through the American League first and, and hit me with any questions or concerns you might have? Or should I do the whole my whole thing? No, actually, yeah. Let's stick with the American League. Uh, John, let's okay. let's show my all-star ballot. Let's see where we had the biggest differences. Oh, you have yours. Okay. Oh, yeah. See, so automatically we had different, a different second baseman, different third baseman, different shortstop, and I took George Springer instead of Taylor Ward. I mean, you got to have George Springer on your list. He's the best leadoff man in baseball, in my opinion. I thought Tim Anderson's killing it. Rafael Devers leads all baseball in extra base hits and hits. And, I mean, this, this was one that I really wanted to talk to you about, though. DH. I saw a lot of people in the comments with your DH selection of Shohei Otani. That's your best friend, I know. But Jordan Alvarez might be the best hitter in baseball right now. Yeah, I absolutely think Jordan should be an all-star. The reason I voted for Shohei is, one, because I love Shohei. He's my best friend. But more importantly than that, it's more a vote of... Shohei needs to be in the All-Star game. Now, if you were to tell me that he would be in from the manager's choice or that he'd get in as a pitcher, whatever it may be, um, he just needs to get in. And for the game of baseball, they desperately need him in. He's not by any means having a bad year. He's, He's towards the top. He's in the top three for MVP odds. He needs to be in. Now, the only place that I could vote for him was in the DH slot. So that's why I that's why I voted for him. I know he needs to be in, and he was that was my only way to be a part of getting him to the All Star game. So that's why I did it. But absolutely, a million percent, Jordan Alvarez deserves to be in the All Star game. Um, but he just happened to be in that same slot that um, that Shohei Otani was. But that's why I voted for Shohei. He is changing the game of baseball. He has been for a few years now. He is great for the game of baseball. He brings eyes that have never seen the game before or that have never really watched he brings those eyes to the game he has transformed the sport that i love the most and that's why i put him at the all-star game because look this is a game for entertainment this isn't this this game doesn't count it's an entertainment thing he entertains and he should be there yeah absolutely and again i think our, our al is where we had really big differences i mean i had to put trevor story at second base just because well, yeah after, let me ask you about that yeah. one I, explain that because trevor story is hitting 230 on the year he's behind jose altuve in virtually every category um what what's your reasoning there because when trevor story gets hot there might not be almost like a better hitter in the AL it seems like I mean when he went on that stretch for about two weeks Trevor's story was just mashing everything he was having seven RBI games five RBI games everything seemed to be like a home run off his bat he was playing really well uh I mean again like Rafael Devers and Tim Anderson it was more so a case of just how well they're hitting the ball this year Rafael Devers again leading the league in hits and in extra base hits I feel like not enough people talk about him they really yeah, should. Yeah, you can't go wrong with either third. You can't go wrong, I feel like, at shortstop with Devers or Jose Ramirez and at shortstop with Tim Anderson and Xander Bogarts. I, I don't have any gripe with you there. Um, I, I hear you there. Devers should be talked about a lot more than he is. Is there anyone on my AL team that you're like, eh, because again, I and catcher was probably one of the hardest ones, but Salvador Perez, man, when he's healthy, he is the best catcher in baseball and no one can tell me otherwise. Yeah, but that's where you get in the conversation of, like, he he hasn't been healthy all of this year. And, you know, 
I, I hear you. And I, last year we saw what he was able to do, and he's a friend of the podcast, so you know I love that. But he, he's been out for a little while. Alejandro Kirk isn't the big name that everybody has, has heard of, but he absolutely deserves to be an all-star for what he has done this year. And other than that, you know, nothing. Um, George Springer's a little surprising to me. Um, you're leaving out. Taylor Ward, who also hasn't been playing as much, so by my own analogy, um, but it, just what he has done this year. Um, but you know that that's pretty much it. I, I like I like your team aside from the, my only big complaint. There is Trevor Story. I mean Jose Altuve. I hear you, Andres Jimenez. I hear you, uh, but Trevor Story. Yeah, oh, listen, listen, I get it, man. If you would have seen the Trevor story that I watched those four nights in Boston with the Mariners playing against the Red Sox, I would have thought we were playing against like, I don't know, like prime Babe Ruth or something. The guy was just unbelievable. He was playing at a really yeah. good level. You know, there are other teams to play against than, than your Mariners, though. There yeah, I, I am aware. I, I, I am very aware. But when that guy did damage and he did a lot of it. But let's move on to your National League team. Let's take his National League okay. team and go through there. Okay. In my On my National League side, at first base, Paul Goldschmidt, second base, friend of the pod, one of the most electric players in baseball, Jazz Chisholm Jr. Third base, Manny Machado, shortstop, Trey Turner. Outfield, I have Mookie Betts, Jock Peterson, and Ronald Acuna, who hasn't even been playing much this year, but in my opinion, deserves to be there for what he has done so far and what he has done to grow the game of baseball. At catcher, Wilson Contreras. Now you could go with either Contreras is there. And at DH, Bryce Harper. Um, so, Producer Conrad, let's, um, let's before we even talk about yours, we're, anything here that jumps out at you a little surprising? I'd be happy to talk you through any of my picks. I mean, I really want you, Jock Peterson, I mean, he's playing actually really, really well right now. Uh, that, that one to me is kind of like, I think that was the one guy I left off, and you'll see who I added onto my list now, Field, but Jock Peterson was my number two there. Uh, and Trey Turner, I, I think Francisco Lindor, I think Frankie's been having a great year, and I don't think this Mets team would be where they're at without him. So I think, yeah, I, I totally agree with that, and that's the that's the um, that's the biggest toss up with my list. I think is those two you mentioned, Jock Peterson, who I fully wholeheartedly believe deserves to be an All Star. Um, it was tough for me. I almost went with Juan Soto, who I think is when you know when right the best hitter in baseball and is a perennial all-star hasn't been great this year though so i ended up going with jock and it's shortstop the toss up there is trey turner and francisco Lindor. you can't go wrong in my opinion i just i went with trey turner because i i just really think this year he's been he's been great they both have been great trey turner is able to swipe a bag whenever he wants he's the coolest slider in the league he's one of the fastest guys in the league um him and him and um, Francisco Lindor have virtually the same war this year. So um, Trey Turner just a tick back. But, ha you know, you know it, it's a toss-up. And it all comes down to who I want to vote for. And I like Trey Turner. I also like Francisco Lindor. So it was a, it was a tough one for me. So I'm, let's see who you went with. Yeah, so I had uh, we had the same list for the most part. Paul Goldschmidt at first, Jazz Chisholm at second, Manny Machado third. Our difference was Francisco Lindor, Trey Turner. We both had Acuna in. Acuna, when he's playing healthy, is just unbelievable. Mookie Betts, what a great year. Juan Soto, this one was kind of weird. Has not been having a great year, but I don't know any other Nationals player that's going to make the All-Star game. And Juan Soto is just obviously one of the faces of baseball. And a guy that doesn't get enough love, in my opinion... Tyler Stevenson. I like that. Really, like really Stevenson. good hitting catcher. I struggle. This is what I struggle with. And I hear you. And I, I struggled with this with the Juan Soto prediction most. Juan Soto is an all-star major leaguer. W without a doubt. He just is. And there's no way around that. He has not been having a good year. Now, the all-star game is all about entertainment. It doesn't matter. It's about entertainment. And he is certainly a guy that can entertain you more than anybody. He's got the Soto shuffle. He does all of that. But what I struggle with is guys that aren't the biggest superstars that deserve to be all-stars for the year that they are having. And that stuff matters. When it comes time for the end of a career, it's like, oh, yeah, so-and-so was an all-star that year. I was a Major League Baseball all-star. Are you kidding me? I, I go back and forth with giving those guys the love that they deserve and the entertainment value that the other guys bring. And, yeah, I don't know. It keeps me up at night. 
<laughs> I mean, listen, I, I I hear you. I think we're all we're all fans out there of different teams, and it always is great to see one of those guys that you thought is having a really great year for your own respected team make it over someone like a Juan Soto. I mean, because Juan Soto, when it's all said and done, will be able to look at a trophy case full of like what ten to fifteen All Star games. If a guy like yeah. Jock Peterson can get his way into a game and he's hitting his way in there, I would agree with your list, and I almost went with Jock Peterson myself. But on those lines. Let's go through your breakout players of 2022 so far. Oh, okay. So these these are our lists for the day. Top five breakout players. And we're going to start with the position players. So top five breakout position players this year. Now, a little bit of a criteria here. You cannot be a rookie because you're not really breaking out. You're just showing how good you are. Can't be a rookie and you can't have won like accolades in the past. For example, like a rookie of the year or like an all-star, gold glove, any of that stuff. So no rookie, no accolades. Let's start with number five. I have Austin Hayes from the Baltimore Orioles. Now, he had 22 homers last year, but his average wasn't great. This year, he's hitting really well, has a bunch of homers already. Austin Hayes has been fantastic for the Baltimore Orioles, and he just doesn't get talked about enough because of him playing for the Orioles. That's pretty much it. He comes in at number five on my breakout players. Let's move on to number four on my list of breakout players this year. I have Tyler Stevenson. Behind the plate for the Reds has been fantastic. Borderline all-star. He could be an all-star in the National League. That's how good he has been. I really like Tyler Stevenson, what he brings to that team. That isn't great, but behind the plate, he's just a bright spot for them. I like Tyler Stevenson a lot. He comes in at number four on this list. Moving on to number three, Alejandro Kirk, who has my vote for American League All-Star Game at the catcher position. He has come up so clutch this year for the Blue Jays. He's hitting over 300. He's hit a bunch of bombs in really clutch situations. Alejandro Kirk comes in at three on my list. Moving on to number two on breakout players, I have Ty France. Now, Ty France has hit everywhere he's been, forever. That's just a fact, okay? We all know that. I had him on this show. He hit almost 400 at AAA, and by almost 400, he hit 399 at AAA. He hit in college. He hit in the minor leagues. He's hit in the big leagues. But this year, it's just different. It's just different what he is doing. He should be an all-star at first base. He's hitting well over 300. The, the accolades, the numbers go on. He's, a, he's now an above 300 hitter in his career in Seattle. I mean, this guy deserves more praise than he gets because he just keeps hitting. And I don't care what other guys are doing. There's plenty of other guys that deserve the praise they get. Ty France deserves that and more for what he has been doing out in the American League at first base for the Seattle Mariners. I will give him that praise. He comes in at number two. So who is number one on this list at top five breakout position players? The winner... Taylor Ward. Now, I know Taylor Ward has missed some games of late with his injuries. He has been so good for the Angels. He has been a guy that, outside of Trout and Otani, he's the guy that made these Angels go. He comes on the scene. He just absolutely rakes. He deserves to be an all-star. He rounds out my list of top five position player breakouts. Taylor Ward, number one, Ty France, number two, Alejandro Kirk, Tyler Stevenson, and Austin Hayes rounds that out. Now I want to do pitchers. There were so many breakout players that we couldn't just do a top five list. We had to do two, and this pitcher list is a fantastic one. So let's start with the top five, and at number five, I have Logan Gilbert as number five on my breakout pitchers list. Logan Gilbert has an ERA in the low twos, He's been fantastic for the Seattle Mariners. And look, the truth of the matter is to start the year, he was dominant. And he's been good in his career, but he hasn't been as good as he is this year. Logan Gilbert comes in at number five on this list. Moving on to number four, I have Michael Kopech. Michael Kopech was a guy that had all the hype in the world. He throws 
upwards of 100 miles an hour. We heard about him coming up, but he just hadn't quite panned out in the big leagues to the tune of like a, a an ERA over five in his first year. And he was kind of a guy that was coming out of the bullpen, but then becoming a starter. And it's like, where does he fit in? Well, I'll tell you where he fits in. He fits in in that starting rotation very nicely for that White Sox team this year. He has figured it out for them. Michael Kopech is still throwing upper 90s with wipeout stuff. This is the Michael Kopech that not only White Sox fans knew would, would be here, but fans of, the, of baseball, this is the guy we expected. MLB The Show came out last year with a future stars Michael Kopech card. Not many guys get that. He got one, and now he's showing why he is a future star in this game, and that star is here. He has broken out in full force. He comes in at number four on this list. At number three, moving on to Pablo Lopez of the Miami Marlins. Pablo Lopez this year has been awesome. And it has been, when you look at that Marlins rotation, you hear the names of Sandy Alcantara, um, you know, th those names. The pronunciation of his name throws me off sometimes. But Alcantara, I believe that's how you pronounce it. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Pablo Lopez has been great. And I, I, like, this, I like this rotation a lot for the Marlins. Now, let's, let, let's talk about this. Because I believe the Marlins should be better than they are. In my opinion, that rotation has been so good. The names just go on. They're so young. They're so good. The batting lineup, the offense should be better than they are. There could be a change there in manager. I, I obviously never want to call for anybody's job, and I hope everybody goes on to succeed and do the best of their ability. But the Marlins should be better than they are right now, especially when they're getting what they have been from Pablo Lopez, who has been good in his career, by the way. But this year, it just seems like he has really, really broken out for the Marlins. He comes in at number three on this list. Moving on. To number two, number two on this list, Shane McClanahan. Leading baseball in strikeouts, by the way. It's just unbelievable. He's pitching today. We record this show on Thursday. He's pitching again. He throws upper 90s from the left side for the Rays. He's a guy that really came on the scene last year, but this year has just blown the doors open of being an absolute dominant ace in the game of baseball, he comes in at number two. Number one on this list, the top breakout pitcher for me, and that goes to Nasty Nestor Cortez. Not a doubt in my mind this year. Now, Nestor has been good so far for the Yankees. You know, last year he kind of announced himself on the scene and it was kind of a guy that it's like, what do we, what do we do with Nestor? Is he doesn't throw mid to upper nineties. He doesn't have that traditional nasty wipeout stuff for a pitcher. So he was kind of a fringe, fringe starter, fringe reliever. What do we want to do with him? Last year he announces himself and says, "Hey, I'm really good and I can get out." So this year, he's been the best pitcher in baseball to this point, and that's not a stretch. He said himself. Somebody asked him, what, what are you trying to do out there on the mound? He said, I'm just trying to strike everybody out. And he's done a pretty good job of that this year. He throws from a million different arm angles. He's nasty. And he rounds out this list of top five breakout pitchers. Nestor Cortez, Shane McClanahan, Pablo Lopez, Michael Kopech, and Logan Gilbert. What a fun show this has been, my friends. I love this live Thursday show. This one has been a blast. A lot to catch you up on. Another managerial firing that we had to get to. Happy to bring on Jake Mintz as well. Trivia went not so great this week, but I'll be back next week, and I will do better on my trivia. Thank you all for joining me. This has been a blast. This is the last episode of the week for Flippin' Bats, so I will see you all next week. Make sure you all listen on Spotify, Apple. Subscribe anywhere you can. That really helps when you subscribe. And we're also on social media. Anywhere you want to find it, at Flippin' Bats Pod. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, every episode you can watch on YouTube. We are also on TikTok as well, so go check that out. Thank you all for joining me, my friends, and I will see you next time on Flippin' Bats. Peace.